Um, that's not because it isn't still here, all right? It's just because it's not here all right, at the moment. Um, I've slept more than I've slept. I can imagine how much I've slept the last three days. So if I happen to nod off during the sermon, just, you know, <laughs> wake me up and we'll try to finish it or uh, get up and leave quietly, all right? And don't, don't, don't disturb me. Uh, but we are glad you're here. If you are a guest at New Hope, we are honored by your presence today. Uh, there's a communication card in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to fill one out, drop it in the offering bag, and uh, let us know of your presence today. We make some promises. We're not going to beat on your door. We're not going to call you on the phone. But we are, through the mail, going to send you information about the church, tells you who we are, what we believe, uh, what kind of ways you can engage, uh, and hopefully answer most of your questions. Those same cards are also for our regular church attenders. If you have information for the staff, prayer requests, updates, those kind of things, please put them on there. We attend to those every Tuesday morning as a staff and address the needs that are on there. And if you don't hear from us, please reach out, let us know. Uh, we are humans and sometimes we make mistakes. They're not intentional, but they happen from time to time. So if you don't get a fairly quick response, we would love for you to reach out and let us know. Uh, and we will do our very best to try to accommodate you. Let me highlight uh, several things that are going to be coming up. Um, there's a little thing on March the 18th. Not much has been said about it, uh, except it's on the March calendar. Uh, it's called the Legacy of Generosity Meeting. That's going to be at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I'll have some handouts for you in the next week or so that will give you more information. It's going to be an hour meeting, about 40 minutes of, uh, of conversation, and then about 20 or 30 minutes of Q&A. There's a gentleman by the name of Bob Price, all right? Uh, he's a terrific gentleman. Christy Miller is a CPA in his firm. Uh, it's here in Clovis. They've been around for a long, long time. Bob is known for uh, his seminars on the legacy of generosity. Uh, he's been very engaged in not-for-profit and nonprofit organizations over the years. This is not a sales pitch. Bob is not here to sell anybody anything. He is here to talk about uh, the rules and the guidelines that we have in this country in terms of charitable giving um, and how we can leave more to our own families, and at the same time, also extend God's kingdom work. And so he's going to look at a few areas in which you can do that while you're still living, as well as also uh, when you leave this world and go to heaven, how you can make a difference. And uh, he's a terrific gentleman. We'll have more information for you that you can take with you, but that's going to be on March the 18th. Um, this has been a recommendation made by a few folks to our finance team and our board. And after meeting with Bob, thought it was a, a great thing for us to bring here, particularly since some laws or, or guidelines are changing, all right, in terms of charitable contributions. Uh, though I tell folks um, it shouldn't make a difference in tithing. I don't care what the rules of the land are. There were no rules when that was mentioned in the Bible, all right? So tithes and offerings shouldn't be based on what deduction that we get. But above and beyond that, there are uh, charitable contributions that are made, and there are some new guidelines out there, and I think Bob will be able to help answer those uh, very, very well. Uh, Easter Choir got its kickoff this past Wednesday night. If you were not able to attend and you have not signed up, I'm not going to pass the sign-up sheet around. I'm just going to tell them to show up, all right? Uh, show up this Wednesday night. If you're able to carry a tune, come join the Easter Choir. Easter Sunday morning, greatest Sunday of the year. Uh, and, and we would just love to, to make a wonderful musical statement, all right, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we'd love to have you come join us uh, for choir practice this coming Wednesday night, 6.30, right here in this room. Uh, also, there is a member of our staff who is aging. Actually, every member of our staff is aging, but <coughs> this particular person happens to have their a very, a most special birthday tomorrow. Corey Gallardo turns 40 tomorrow. <laughs> Corey, would you stand please, all right? Happy birthday to Corey. You know you are right in the middle of middle age now, my dear. Okay, well, I just thought I would tell you, you are right in the heart of it now. Um, I remember when she was just a child and about 15 years of age when she stepped foot here on the property at, uh, at New Hope and became part of our high school group. And uh, thank you so very much for filling the pulpit one of the Sundays I was gone. I heard you did a great job. So happy birthday, my dear. Um, let's see, there's going to be next Sunday afternoon at 1215 a lunch meeting for any of you who are part of our ushers, greeters, or parking posse. So if you were one of the volunteers for any one or all of those three, 
next Sunday, 1215, lunch here at the church and a very special meeting. Um, today and next Sunday, some mandatory meetings for those who are going to be going to Mexico, adults included in that. If you're an adult going on our high school Mexico mission trip, you need to attend the meeting today. They need you there. Can you believe we are two weeks away from one of the most, sun, most fun Sundays we have every year here at New Hope? The pie auction is two weeks from tonight. This snuck up on me, I guess, because of Africa. But two weeks from tonight is our annual pie auction. If you are new at New Hope, you want to put this on your calendar. You want to come check this evening out. Participate with us. Here's what happens. <coughs> um, for about 20 years now, our kids uh, during Easter week have been going on mission trips. Most of those trips have been to Mexico. For a few years, we went to an Indian reservation in Arizona, but most of the years we've been going to Mexico. We like to engage in long-term mission commitments. Right now, we're in the midst of a commitment with an organization down there that is building an orphanage. We've helped them the last two years. We're working on the next phase with them again this year. It's about a five-year project with them. And so um, we have about 40 high school kids who are going down. For some of these kids, it is their first taste of what mission activity is all about. They do their part to raise their funds to go on this mission trip, and then we help with the cost of the construction and the additional cost that are there. We try to underwrite that as a church. Uh, the first few years they did that, they tried car washes, they tried uh, yard sales. Um, after one yard sale here at the church parking lot, I said, never, ever again. Uh, <laughs> It was just a way for people to leave their garbage here. And so I said, let's try something. And we tried about, uh, about 18 years ago, an old fashioned pie auction. And what an old fashioned pie auction is, it's where people in the church make their best homemade dessert. And they bring it and we auction it off. I play auctioneer that night. I got 10, who's gonna give me 20, 20? Who's gonna give me 30? I'm looking for 30. Who's and we do that for about an hour and a half. Last year, we raised over $23,000 doing that auction. It's, uh, the first year was about 6000 and it's gone up every year. Uh, our, our, and, and so we're going to be doing that. Now, we don't limit it just to just desserts. You can make your best homemade casserole, make your best homemade dish. Uh, if you have a business, if you're a painter, as some have done in the past, you want to donate a room of painting or a certain amount of, of, of painting, you can do that. Uh, we've got a couple of guys here who have a sideline business called Bite Me Barbecue, and uh, they, they auction off a barbecue for 50. Some of you all have taken advantage of it and you bought it more than once. So they didn't kill you. So you keep coming back. Um, but we have people who've donated uh, from their, their businesses, all sorts of things, new bikes, uh, trees, um, bring whatever you would like. All right. This is new stuff uh, or your best homemade meal. And uh, what, what, what this is good for is a couple of things. One is as adults, we let our kids know that what they're doing is important to us. We come alongside of them. They work that event that night. They're the ones who set up. They're the ones who tear down. Uh, they're the ones who handle all of that. They're the ones who are going to the mission field to work. And if we take in more than what is necessary for the Mexico mission trip, then the remaining funds are used in missions somewhere during the year, whether it ends up being used in Africa, whether it's another mission trip to Mexico. So uh, whatever you tend to donate, please know it is all going to be going to mission activity that evening. But that will be at six o'clock on March the 11th. And uh, you need to bring your desserts, your things if you can by 530. So they have time to get everything cataloged and numbered so that's a very very smooth evening. And uh, come and join us. If you can't stay the whole time, that's okay. You don't have to come for part of it. I will tell you, occasionally it gets a little crazy. We have had some desserts go for $1,000. We know that there's not any dessert that's worth $1,000, but the mission trip is. All right, and so that's what it's all about. Don't get offended if yours doesn't go for $1,000, all right? Um, sometime one year, somebody's went for 1000 the next year it went for $100. It's, it, it, it's just the way it goes that evening. Uh, but all of it, and whether you can contribute $25 or $1,000 that night, it's the fact that the little and the much all put together meets the need. 
and it's a great time for our church family, both old and young, to be together for a common purpose that is Christ-centered and kingdom expanding. So that's just two weeks from tonight. It's going to be here before we know it. Wednesday night, kids program kicked off last Wednesday, and our adult Bible study on Wednesday night, not too late for you to join them this coming Wednesday. Uh, Celebrate Recovery, our Thursday night outreach for those who have hurts, habits, or hangups. Do you realize this next month, it's been nine years since we started Celebrate Recovery here? And hundreds of people, yeah. (coughs) Literally hundreds of people in our church and in our community who are not part of our church and individuals from other churches. Because see, sometimes folks would rather go to a Celebrate Recovery outside of their own church. Because sometimes they don't want to share their hurts, habits, and hangups with people in their own congregation. And so we have been a place of rescue uh, through our Celebrate Recovery program. Eric Olson and his team have done a terrific job in doing that. And they're going to have a nine-year anniversary celebration coming up on March the 8th. And that's a Thursday night. There'll be a barbecue dinner from 5.30 to 6.30. You could come straight from work here, have dinner. And then there'll be a worship celebration here in the sanctuary at 6.30. There'll be some music. There are going to be some testimonies of those whose lives have been transformed because of Celebrate Recovery. And then a brief message of encouragement to wrap things up. So hope you'll come and celebrate with us as a church family on Thursday evening, March the 8th. Um, Hey, Saturday. Fawn, are you in here? Yes, Fawn. You've got a big event coming up this Saturday, right? Yeah, you want to stand up and tell them just a little bit about it? A painting party. Painting party, yeah. Uh, Okay, so uh, actually I saw the picture. It's a beautiful cross, kind of a rose vine on it. And uh, we had the picture up last week. It looks awesome. It's a women's event. I actually have considered this week cross-dressing for next Saturday <laughs> so that I can, I can come to the event. Uh, so ladies, uh, I, would, I would hustle out there because it's a limited number because there's only so much room to set up. So uh, you need to go out and get your tickets there today. Uh, please take note of the women's retreat coming up in April. The directions are there of how you can sign up for that. Widow's lunch bunch, date and time is there. Men's uh, breakfast coming up in March as well. Please put that on your calendar and come enjoy some men's fellowship. Um, I am so glad that they put up the picture of Billy Graham up on our screen today. Uh, Our world has been a different place because of the impact of Billy Graham's 99 years on the face of this earth. And um, I I remember when um, we had the crusade here in 01, um, and just a month before the crusade, 911 hit. And there was a discussion of canceling the crusade. And uh, the decision of all of us on the executive team was why would we allow fear to trump faith? And um, Shelly and I know our, we are very grateful for that crusade here because that uh, is one of the evenings uh, at the crusade in which Ashley gave her life to Jesus Christ and teacher Eddie uh, got to be with her. Um, pardon me? Oh, Craig Parker got to be with her down front as, uh, as she received Christ. And so it was a very special moment for our family. Um, and so we simply want to be praying. Franklin Graham is going to be coming uh, through the valley. You'll hear more about this later. I believe it's in the month of May, and there's going to be a, a one a Sunday evening event, and you'll hear much more about that. Mark Addis is going to be part of their staff for the next two months in preparation for that special event. So uh, please be praying for the Graham organization and the extended Graham family as, as they enjoy this celebration of their father and grandfather's homegoing. Uh, Joe and Mary Avley are very happy this weekend. They have a brand new granddaughter. Uh, came about nine or ten days late, but finally showed up. Her name is Rosemary June. I seriously doubt if they named it after my mother, but that's the line I'm taking, and so she's going to be a very special young lady. The Drakes also are grandparents again this week. They have a brand new grandson, and we are grateful for that. Um, and uh, I'm not a grandfather again yet, but I do know that when I am in August, it's going to be another grandson. All right, we found that out this week, so the rolling name lives on. 
Um, some prayer requests. Um, uh, John Ortega. John is um, uh, the McGuins, who are part of our church family. This is Irma's brother. He has been in the hospital 18 days. He's had three surgeries. He's in ICU. I had the opportunity to go and pray with him yesterday morning. Uh, so be praying for John as he goes through this battle. Ray Steele, one of our board members, members of our church, uh, he went through five more radiation treatments for a tumor in the brain. Uh, uh, Ray is a walking miracle with a glioblastoma tumor. Um, he's been battling it for over three years now. And uh, it had grown a little bit, and so they did some more treatment. We'll find out the results in a few weeks. So be praying for Ray and his family. <coughs> Johnny Miller is still at uh, Clovis Community Hospital. He has finished his first round of 10 days of treatments. He's on a short break right now. He's wiped out, all right? Um, he's where he's supposed to be in this process. It's not a pleasant process to have your bone marrow killed. Um, and so he'll be in there for 30 days, and then he'll get to go home for 30 days. But be praying for him and Jeannie as they go through uh, this process together. Milt Pierce, we have good news. I think they'll be in the next service. Uh, Milt had a, a tumor uh, down by his liver. It was about the size of a lemon through radiation and chemo. It's been reduced to the size of his thumbnail, and they're going to be doing surgery in April to remove the reduced tumor, and so they're very grateful for that. Trish and Joe Sanchez, a couple who's been in and out of our church over the years. Uh, their kids and, and our kids grew up together. Uh, Trish has sung in our Easter choir a couple of times in years past. Uh, Trish had a stroke while riding her horse, uh, fell off, broke her collarbone. She's been unconscious for the last eight days. She is, at, um, uh, she is now at Kaiser. She was at Fresno Community. Uh, she is with the Kaiser organization, and so they have moved her just in the last uh, 24 hours there. Um, they're just waiting for, hopefully, for her to wake up from the stroke. Um, so would appreciate you remember to pray for Joe and Trish. Uh, and then I had a message on my cell phone uh, halfway through the last service. Um, a, a young man, again, who grew up at Buchanan. Uh, one of my son's really, really good friends. I coached him in Babe Ruth baseball. Uh, his name is uh, Charlie Morlock. Charlie's dad uh, was, was found uh, dead in his bed this morning at 7 o'clock. And so uh, Charlie is grappling with those issues. Um, unexpected, but his dad had been sick, but just uh, didn't appear to be at this stage right now. So please be praying for Charlie and his family as they have to make all these plans and adjustments. So those are, are just a few of the prayer requests and updates. In our 1045 service, we do have a child dedication, which is one of the wonderful experiences we get to celebrate here at the church. Is everybody warm enough in here? Why don't we turn the heaters off? I think we'll probably be fine now. There's enough 98.6 heaters going off already. Um, would you join with me as we pray? Our ushers are going to come forward and wait on us as we have our tithes and offering today. <coughs> the young girl thought, I'm glad he kissed me, but I wished my grandmother hadn't slapped him for doing it. As the train broke into the sunlight, the soldier could not wipe the smile off his face. He had just seized the opportunity to kiss a pretty girl and slap his commanding officer, and he got away with both. <laughs> you got to love it. Seizing opportunities. We need to learn to be as wise as that young man. We need to learn to seize the days. Unfortunately, so often we get caught up in the details of day-to-day -day living that we just don't have the time to seize the day for Christ. We have deadlines and commitments and problems and priorities, distractions and obstacles in front of us. And though we really want greater fulfillment in our life, it just seems to be outside of our grasp and we hope maybe in the next season of life I'll do better at seizing the day. I don't think there's a one of us here who wants our life just to be average. By nature, we want our lives to be full, full and prosperous and rewarding. Paul shares these words with believers at the church of Ephesus. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15, 16, and 17, Paul wrote these words. Be careful then how you live. Be careful how you live. 
I don't think we do injustice to the passage by saying Paul is challenging us, seize the day. Don't let the events of life stop you from seizing the moment. He gives us added direction. Don't live as unwise people, but live as those who are wise, those who would seize the day. How do I know I'm not doing an injustice to the passage by that addition is the next phrase. Make the most of every opportunity. Every day has its set of opportunities. And Paul says, make the most of them. And the reason it's important is because the time period we're living in is evil. So don't be foolish. Don't waste the day. But understand what the will of the Lord, the open door is for you. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, Paul said on one occasion, when I am weak, then you are strong. Father, today may I be the weakest I've ever been and may you be the strongest we've ever seen. In your son's name we pray. Amen. If we're a Christian, that's a cute sound. And what I mean by being a Christian, if you're, if you're new here, let me clarify real quickly. A Christian is not somebody who's a member of a church. You can be a member of a church, die and go to hell. Just having your name on a roll of a church doesn't make you a Christian. Being born in America doesn't make you a Christian. Because you've adhered to a list of do's and don'ts that seem to be morally right is not what makes you a Christian. There is one thing and one thing alone that makes you and I a Christian if we are one, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. The scripture says, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, then we will be saved. If you have never ever done that, I have bad news for you. You're not a Christian. I don't care how much you think you are one. I don't care how much good you think you've accomplished in your life. We do not enter into heaven because of a merit system. It's not by our goodness we get there. It is by our acknowledgement that we are not good enough. The Bible says we were born in our sin and our trespasses. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means no one's exempt. No one is left out. And when we become aware of our own sinfulness, we become aware of the sinlessness of Jesus. And we believe that he came from heaven to earth. He lived for 33 years. He died the cruel death of the cross to pay a debt that you and I owed that we could never pay. And he paid a debt that he did not owe and he could easily pay. And you and I appropriate for ourselves the finished work of Jesus Christ, the one who lived, died, and rose again for us. He died as payment for our sin and he rose again to come be the very source of life that you and I live today. And if he is not the source of our life, then we are not Christians. Nothing less, nothing more, nothing else, but trust in Jesus Christ. If we call ourselves Christians today, then we've been given a mission. It's a mission that could easily have the code name 24-7. We're not a Christian 18-6. We're not a Christian 12-3, though we try to get away with it. It's 24-7. 24-7, we are to be reflections of Jesus Christ. 24-7, we are to shine his light, the light of his good news to those around us. 24-7, our lives are to be a testimony to his light that is within us. Throughout history, God has shown himself in and through relationships relationships with his people and the incarnation and incarnation is just a theological terms that means Jesus became a man God became more than words on the page of a book or a spirit floating in the heavens John chapter 1 says the word became flesh and it dwelt amongst us and the word is Jesus Christ 
Jesus, the Word made flesh, gave his disciples both power and vision, a picture to help them live this glorious life called the Christian life 24-7. Jesus could have simply given his disciples power, yet he spent three years discipling them, modeling the life that he intended to live. And what was that life that Jesus modeled? You hear me say this again and again, and if I'm still around a while, you're going to hear me say it again and again and again. Here is the life that Jesus modeled. These are his own words. Jesus said, the words that you hear me say, the things that you see me do, every miracle you've seen me, you, you've seen me perform, Everything I say and I do, it is not me who does it, but it is my Father who lives in me, who does it through me. And this life that I have lived on the basis of my Father in me is the same life that I am calling you to live. As my Father sent me with all that the Father is for every demand that the Father placed on the life of the Son, it is my Father in me who does it. And as my Father sent me with all that he is, I send you with all that I am to do everything that I ask you to do on my behalf. Isn't that a great way to live the Christian life? It is not by the power that I willed, but it is by the power that I surrender to of the one who lives within me. He can. I can't. He never said I could. He always said he would. That is the Christian life. And are we living it? Do we live in that reality every moment of every day, 24-7? Many have rejected the church because of the actions of those who claim to be Christians. It's painful, but it's true. I visited a man in the hospital this week whose family told me when he asked for a pastor to come, we were so excited because he has been so angry at the church and God for years. And sometimes we were appalled, well, how could you be angry at the church and God? And then we realized how we've acted sometimes and we couldn't be more surprised. Much of the world rejects Christianity because far too many who call themselves Christians are not known as people who live what they speak. The truth is, until we move beyond superficial faith, we will not experience supernatural living. Do you realize that as Christians, our daily life should be reflected by supernatural living? A peace that passes human understanding when the world is in chaos and yet his people are at peace? That is supernatural supernatural living, making the right moral decisions when it's so easy to make the immoral decision. That is supernatural living. Facing death without fear because death doesn't hold any claim on our life because we know the risen life of Jesus Christ and we convey that to those who are around us. That is supernatural living. When our friends and our family are sick and facing trials and we are there to encourage support and, and be part of their hope system that is supernatural living sad that maybe things don't turn out the way we we want them to but knowing that this is God's best for their life and one day all of this stuff will be over and there'll be a place where there is no sorrow and no pain and we can live in an attitude of joy in those circumstances that is supernatural living you heard me say, I think, in the opening prayer, when Major Thomas defined a miracle, man, that stuck, when there's no other explanation for God. And when is the first time or the last time somebody said, I can't think of any other reason for the life you live except God. And yet that's the kind of life that God has given to us. What picture does Jesus give us as we look at his life and listen to his words? Jesus loved the unlovable. Jesus went out of his way to go to those who everybody else avoided. When is the last time that you went out of your way to somebody you would rather avoid? You might even be living in the same house with them. Do you understand that the death of Christ on the cross was so sufficient that if Hitler with his last breath had given his life to Jesus Christ, God would have forgiven him. Do you understand that? 
Do you understand that if Saddam Hussein had come to a moment in his life before his death that he said, Lord Jesus, I believe you are who you said you were, that God would have forgiven him for all that he had done? Some of us are repulsed by that thought. See, it's not how good you are or how bad you are, it's how humble you're willing to be. The sufficiency of, if, if Christ's forgiveness wasn't enough for them, then how, how do I have assurance it's enough for me? And how do I have assurance it's enough for you? The scripture tells us that the finished work of Jesus Christ was enough to deal with the sin of all mankind. All of it. And so Jesus went to the unlovable. Jesus forgave the unforgivable. Who were you still harboring ill will because they stole your recipe, got your promotion, somebody's favorite aunt and you should be? Jesus reached out to the untouchable. Across the street from the bombed out federal building in Oklahoma City, I've been there numerous times. I'm moved every time I go to that memorial. And you know what, folks? We can't blame any foreign terrorist for that. Homegrown in our own backyard. That's where 168 people were killed. And there's an incredible memorial that stands there so that we as a nation never, ever forget. Inside the, what I call the courtyard of that memorial, there are, there are two towers at the end of a, a pool it has the time in which it started and the time in which it ended. Adjacent to that is a grassy area. There are 168 illuminated chairs. The chairs are of different size. The smaller chairs are for the children who were in the daycare in that facility that were killed. The larger chairs are for the adults. Those chairs are structured in certain rows that reflect the story, first story, second story, third story, fourth story, where those individuals were at the time of the bombing. It's so personalized and yet so community just across the street on the west side of that memorial, just right across the street, is a nine-foot statue of Jesus. His face is slightly turned away, and his face is buried in his hands. And the plaque at the bottom of that statue has simply three words on it. And Jesus wept at the tragedy and the senselessness of lost lives. Ever since I've seen that statue, I've wondered if there was a statue erected just across the street from where I live. And God looked at my life what would be inscribed at the bottom of that statue? Would Jesus look at my life and the, the missed opportunities that I've, I've let just go by and would he weep? Tragedy comes in all different shapes and sizes and lost opportunities are senseless tragedies. Do we understand all that Jesus has done for us? Uh, let me just tell a quick story. It's not theological, but I think it captures the heart. There was a small boy who had been consistently late for dinner, tardy. One particular day, his parents were tired of always waiting for him, food getting cold. And they told him, this must not happen again. He needs to be on time for dinner tonight. That very evening, he was the latest he had ever been. He already found his parents sitting at the table. They had already started to eat. Quickly, he sat at his place, and then he noticed 
Before him was a plate with a single slice of bread and a small glass of water. He understood the message. This is all he was going to get for dinner. There was silence as he looked at the plate and looked at his father. And slowly he saw his father's hand reach over and take the plate with a slice of bread on it. And with his other hand, he picked up his full plate and he set in its place a plate with a single slice of bread. And he handed his full plate and he placed it in front of his son. You see, this dad made an exchange. They had told the son there was a price that was going to be paid and the price was paid. But it wasn't paid by the son, it was paid by the father. When Jesus died on a cross, he paid a price because Adam sinned in the garden thousands of years before God said there's a price that must be paid. But Adam couldn't pay it and Abraham couldn't pay it and King David couldn't pay it. Jesus said, I'll pay it. Paul calls it the great exchange. Our sinfulness for his perfection. Our unrighteousness for his holiness. Our hatred for his love. That's what God does for us. When that boy who experienced the exchange of plates by his father became a man, he often said, all my life I've known what God was like by what my father did that night. Isn't that what Christians are supposed to be? That others can see what God is like by the way in which his children live? Jesus clearly taught that we are to reflect him with our lives. We are called to be transformed into his image. It's a great assignment. Jesus promised to provide all the power that we need. Remember Jesus' words to his disciples? Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. This is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Ever since the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ and the debt of our sin was paid, God in the person of the Holy Spirit bringing to us the life of Jesus Christ in the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. Acts 1, 7 and 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. Jesus promised us power to fulfill the mission of the Christian life. But remember, the power is a person. The power is not a sword that you and I wield with our own strength. The power is the person of Jesus Christ who wields our life as we give him permission to do so. Are you giving him daily permission to do that in you? We are Christ's disciples. We are not just simply to be fans of Jesus Christ. I've had people use that expression to me when they found out I was a Christian. Ah, oh, you know what? I'm a fan of Jesus. Good. Hope you can cheer from hell. You see, fans sit on the sidelines. Disciples are in the field of play. Disciples are in the midst of the action. You and I must be his sons and daughters who are in the action 24-7, seizing the day. A man once told his wife that he never wanted to live in a vegetative state dependent upon a machine. And he told her, if that ever happens to me, I want you to pull the plug. So she got up and unplugged the television. <laughs> are you in a vegetative state today? Or are you in the field of play? Experiencing the power and the presence 24-7. We are to pick up this book and we are to live it as Jesus lived the words of his own life. We are to evaluate our lives, our relationships, our actions, our reactions, our priorities, our resources in the light of our relationship with God and his word. 
Are we going anywhere? Is there a purpose for all of this? You see, purpose is what gives meaning to our life. It gives one the ability to say, I know what I'm doing and I know why I'm doing it. It's what Paul meant when he said in 2 Timothy 1.12, for which cause I suffer these things, I am not ashamed because I know. Do you have that confidence? Can you say, I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded. I'm not wishy-washy. I am persuaded that he is able to keep me until that day. Are we living like we know, like we are persuaded? The question needs to be asked, are we living or just existing? There is a difference between the two. If some of you are completely honest, some of you would have to admit today that you are empty inside. You are not filled to the brim with life. I'm not saying that we all need to live lives of great liberality with a new wild crazy change every day. But we can learn to live lives that are full of vigor and livelihood rather than being content with just getting by and existing. We can learn from our sins and our failures and our setbacks, but don't let them be a yoke around our neck. For Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We need to learn to live and love and love to live. Live in God's love and love to live God's life. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is where? In you, whom you have received from God. That's what it means to be a Christian. We are not our own, but we were bought with a price. Glorify God with your life. Make the most out of this one life that he has given to us. It is time... It is time to stop telling God how big our problems are. And it's time to start telling our problems how big our God is. How big is your God? This might be the most important question you ever ask yourself as a Christian. Your answer to that question will determine your spiritual future from this moment on. A.W. Tozier, an incredible writer and preacher of another generation, said it best, a low view of God is the cause of a hundred lesser evils. But a person with a high view of God is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems. A small God is the cause of a lot of evil. A big God is the solution to thousands of problems. According to writer Pastor Mark Batterson, it's also the difference between being a scaredy cat or a lion chaser. If your God is smaller than a 500-pound lion, you'll run away. But if your God is bigger than a 500-pound lion, you might just muster the moral courage to chase lions. So I ask you again, how big is your God? Is your God bigger than your biggest problem? Is he bigger than your worst failure? Is he bigger than your greatest fear? Let me lay, as I wrap this up, a foundation for the rest of your life. I want to share with you what I think is a linchpin of practical theology. This is ground zero. Everything else, I believe, is supported on this foundation, and it's found in the book of Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Here's what Isaiah wrote as he quotes God. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts higher than yours. Do you know what God is saying? God is saying I'm smarter than you. Don't think you can outthink me. God is saying, I'm stronger than you. Don't think that you can pin me. God is saying, until you come to grips with the fact that I am far beyond what you can comprehend, you will struggle in your life. Thomas Jefferson loved the teachings of Jesus. In fact, he said they were the most sublime and benevolent code of morals which had ever been offered to man. But Jefferson was a child of the Enlightenment era. He didn't have a cognitive category for miracles, so literally... One evening he sat down and he took a pair of scissors and he started cutting out verses out of the King James Bible that he owned. It took him three nights. And by the time he was finished, he even cut out the virgin birth, angels, and the resurrection. Jeffrey extracted every miracle and the end result was a book that he called The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. 
Later it became referred to as Jefferson's Bible. Here's the deal. Some of us might scoff at Jefferson. Say, Tim, I, I, you can't pick and choose like that. You can't cut and paste. You can't do that to the Bible. But listen very carefully to me this morning. While most of us would never take a pair of scissors and literally physically cut out verses of the Bible the way we live our lives, we do that very same thing. We ignore God's truth in our life. We practice what could be called cut and paste Christianity. Oh no, I'll never have sex before marriage until that one person says, I love you. Why should we wait? Oh no, I, I, I don't need to be kind to that neighbor. I'll be kind to this neighbor. Think of thousands of excuses where you and I have cut and pasted Christianity. We believe what we can comprehend with our cerebral cortex. We embrace what we can control. And I think one of two things happens over a course of time. Either our theology conforms to our reality and our God gets smaller and smaller. Or our reality conforms to our theology and God gets bigger and bigger. At the end of the book called Prince Caspian, any of you ever read it? Chronicles of Narnia? Okay, you all are illiterate. <laughs> okay. You need to read the Chronicles. I know as grandparents, you've probably bought them for your grandchildren. Read them yourself. They're a wonderful set of books. Prince Caspian, it's, a, it's an allegorical story, and in it there's a, a girl named Lucy. She walked through the wardrobe closet, ended up in this magical land called Narnia. And there she met Aslan the lion, and Aslan the lion is the picture of Jesus Christ in the story. Lucy had been away from Narnia for about a year, and when she shows up and she runs into Aslan the lion, she says, Aslan, you are bigger than I remember. And Aslan says, oh, Lucy, that is because you are older. And Lucy said, not because you are older. He said, no, I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Every time we grow in our faith in Jesus Christ, God is bigger. We must learn this 24-7. Folks, it's time to get off the sidelines. It's time to seize the day. I've asked the worship band to come back up. I know we're running late. Ushers, don't let anybody in for a minute, okay? It's okay. I don't do this often. If you're new here today, I don't do this every Sunday. I don't do this three or four Sundays a year. But some of you have been worshiping a God who is far too small. And this is a day that you need to seize the opportunity and you need to make a decision. Some, there may be a few of you who are here, you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life. You've heard a brief explanation of what it means to be a Christian and it rung true in your heart. I'm going to ask you to do something very brave and seize the opportunity. I'm going to ask you to come forward while we sing this song here in just a moment. But there are others of you, the vast majority of you I know, you're believers. But circumstance life has given you too small a God. You've let your life and circumstances shape the size of your God rather than allow your God to reshape the size of your life. And you're through with that today. You say, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm ready to have a bigger God. I'm going to ask you to surrender all and step forward as our worship band sings today. If God is nudging you, don't hesitate. Just come forward and we'll pray together. Let's sing.